Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Justice and Peace's guest speaker series and our focus here on meeting the lawyer venture candidates. Uh, as always, the views are of the candidates alone and uh, don't reflect me, Justice and Peace's Trias College or any of the organizations or education institutions I'm affiliated with. And with that in mind, uh, thank you so much, Peter, for taking the time and joining us here today. Perhaps, Peter, you can tell us a little bit more about yourself. And uh, once again, thanks for joining. So I've been in practice since 1986. Um, so I've been practicing approximately a little over 35 years in civil litigation. I've done all sorts of cases, uh, trials, applications, appeals, uh, primarily civil work, but I also do a lot of administrative law. And I was um, I became a bencher in 2011 and was a bencher from 2011 to 2019. So Peter, with those don't eight years of experience there, what brings you back here in 2023 <laughs> to run for bench for a third time? Um, I mean, that's a good question. The uh, I, I think uh, what brought me back uh, was watching what's taking place over the last four years. And there's been a lot of dysfunction at the law society at the governing table. Um, a lot of embarrassing incidents, people uh, engaging in uncivil behavior. Uh, one one bencher uh, threatening to sue the law society, another bencher starting a lawsuit against the law society, and just a lot of disruption and dysfunction. And um, it's been unfortunate. Uh, a lot of the things that the group I ran with originally uh, worked very hard to bring about, uh, are now being threatened. And so I felt it was important for me to put my name back in the ring, so to speak. So perhaps maybe you can kind of tell us a bit about sort of historically, you know, those eight years there. Now I was talking with uh, Will earlier and uh, kind of what the law society in, in its uh, maybe traditionally, right, in those tiers, um, what sort of the function, what was it like at convocation and, and compared to what you've seen now over the last four years? Well, convocation is, uh, as you know, um, there are 40 elected uh, lawyer benchers. There are five paralegals. For most of the time I was a bencher, there were actually a pretty large group of unelected benchers. And it 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 is organized a little bit like a mini parliament. But essentially, people uh, from all over the province, different practice areas, different interests, all learn to work together cooperatively uh, in the public interest. A lot of it relates to the two primary functions of the law society are you know, lawyer regulation, which includes all the way up to discipline, and uh, lawyer licensing, which I was very much involved in, and as well, uh, lawyer continuing education. So. Um, a significant part of the law society's work is about, you know, regulation, regulatory structure, the rules of professional conduct, uh, rule reform, things like that. And then the discipline process, the law society tribunal that deals with lawyer discipline, uh, and then lawyer education, which involves everything from, you know, CPD to things like uh, the coaching initiative that uh, we put in place while I was a bencher. So, I would say the eight years, um, a lot of things, there were a lot of initiatives during that time. And I was very happy to be associated with some of them. Uh, one of them I was very much involved in was uh, debate about articling and about the future of lawyer education. Um, and for uh, a lengthy period of time, I chaired a committee that looked at all of that. So, um, you know, those are things that are important uh, to the bar. And then there are specific issues that come up from time to time that just, um, you know, uh, benchers have to deal with. So uh, one of the things that I'd like to get across to people watching this program is it really is important uh, what the Law Society does. It's not just, um, you know, the call to the bar and giving out um, honorary degrees to people. It actually does a lot of real work, and a lot of what it does is quite important to the two professions. Now, with that, in terms of looking at those eight years and now, if you are elected and if the 
good governance coalition again we don't know how it's going to shape up in terms of one some most none but uh what would you like to sort of see in terms of that vision i know on 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 of the group but uh you know from that eight years and and again looking at the next four years what are some of the things either to bring back or some new initiatives that we can focus on if you're elected well i'm uh I think that we left some of the work undone with respect to lawyer licensing and what we need to do about it in the future. Uh, as you know, articling uh, has has had a lot of difficulties and uh, it doesn't actually provide a consistent quality um, uh, learning environment for all those who go through it. We also have a lot of candidates who come back to Canada, either from, from Canadians going abroad to study or uh, uh, folks from countries all over the world who come to Canada to become licensed. And those people typically aren't able to get articling jobs. So we have a rather complex three-tiered structure right now where there are three different routes to become uh, licensed. And I think over time that's got to change. So that's one of the issues I think that needs to be addressed. There are issues that need to be um, worked on with uh, the Law Society Tribunal. We brought in a lot of um, members of the public to serve. One of the questions is going to be whether we continue to uh, distance that uh, tribunal from the elected representatives. And then we have all sorts of work to do um, in sort of what I would call um, EDI initiatives. Um, you know, as you, as you probably know, when I was a venture, we put in place uh, mandatory uh, EDI initiatives, and I'm a strong proponent of those, and I think they need to be increased. And we continue to have um, issues relating to uh, supporting women in the profession, and uh, there are there is an initiative that's currently underway, but there's more that needs to be done. Okay, those so let's are, unpack- those are just a few things. <laughs> yeah, so let's try to unpack <laughs> a couple of those points there. Uh, so articling, I mean, articling, I mean, even when I was articling in like 2000, uh, you know, 10 years ago, right, that the, there was the same issue, I think, prior to the LPP, uh, you know, where they... Uh, positions so should they be paid i know there was a whole discussion you know, 10 years later i was surprised that hey are we still discussing these kinds of things but i mean what do you sort of propose to kind of deal with this th- three-tiered structure that we have in place i mean uh, i know not everyone necessarily has the same ideas of you know with you know even within the coalition but i mean what would you ideally like to see in terms of getting consistency in the quality of, of article well, ideally, we'd have one route for all licensing candidates. So there's no issue of, you know, inequality between the licensing routes. That may not, that just may not be possible because of the number of entrants we have. You know, it's somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 entrants a year. So, um, and over time, if you went backwards, you know, the articling, um, it, the firms that provide articling jobs are primarily either government or the large law firms. You know, sole practitioners can't typically afford uh, articling students. And so it's been difficult to increase articling positions over time. I think eventually we're going to have to look at um, doing away with articling. Having said that, you know, most people in the profession, like you, article, and a lot of them remember their articling positions as being a really good time where they learned a lot. So it's not something we really want to throw away quickly, but we should be thinking about other long-term long-term alternatives. And the next point you brought up was again the Law Society Tribunal and, and distancing um benchers and, and and from sort of being in, in those roles. Uh perhaps we can kind of elaborate a bit more on what maybe needed to be done to sort of structure or restructure sort of who sits on the tribunal and adjudicates or or what you would propose differently? Well, right now, uh, elected benchers um, have, the, have the ability to become members of the tribunal and to sit on um, lawyer and paralegal discipline matters. We also have appointed lawyers. Right now, I'm an adjudicator, but I'm appointed. I'm not elected. And then we have members of the public. A lot of tribunals are putting more members of the public on their disciplinary bodies because it it really helps 
uh, ensure the independence of adjudication and separates it from uh, the electorate. And I think that's the direction we're eventually going to have to go. We also, I mean, this is just a technical issue, but we have an appeal panel right now. And it's something that we have to look about whether we really still need an appeal panel. We've worked really hard to train our adjudicators so that we have more sort of consistent um, uh, writing in our decision making. And uh, hopefully we'll come a point where we won't need an appeal tribunal. Yeah, that's, I mean, but that's kind of inside baseball, I got to say. I think the bigger point is just um, having members of the public involved in lawyer and paralegal discipline is really important. Yeah, because I mean, I think that's the, the other perspective that comes up, you know, in terms of the public interest, like even overall, right, that, you know, sometimes I certainly speak with some of the paralegal venture candidates and they point to, you know, can lawyers and paralegals sort of coexist because, uh, you know, there's sort of this inherent tension um, and then knowing on your coalition, obviously, there's both paralegal and lawyer ventures running. But again, the, the overall perspective is supposed to be in the public interest. So the more members of the public that are involved within the, the law study would certainly speak to uh, better looking at the public interest than maybe the lawyer or paralegal interest. That's that's right. And, it, it, you know, I just want to make a point about paralegals. Paralegals are uh, an important part of providing legal services to the public. Um, we've worked well at convocation with our paralegal colleagues who've been elected. And uh, although there's sometimes issues that we disagree on, um, it's actually been a great relationship. And um, I sit on discipline matters involving paralegals, and I often sit with a paralegal colleague. So, um, you know, there's less, uh, there's less tension and, and stress between the two professions than you might think. And then the third point you brought up was, you know, EDI and, and perhaps expanding it. You know, I've, I've talked to some, again, at this point, you know, uh, mostly paralegal venture candidates, but a couple mentioned you know, taking one position of just scrapping EDI initiatives altogether. Uh, and I suppose you know, other people that I'll talk to uh, through the rest of the series will kind of have similar positions. I mean, then you have on the other side, you know, you're saying like expand it. We're hearing you know, decisions from judges about the importance of lawyers being culturally competent to their clients, you know, trauma-informed lawyering. So perhaps maybe you can expand more on why, you know, not only should it not be cut, but you know, further expanded and the importance in terms of you know, both maybe your position as well as you no know, others that are running alongside with you. Well, I think it comes from things like uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, some of the calls to action, which, um, you know, the legal profession, the judiciary, governments are still struggling to implement. And just the fact that we have a very culturally diverse society uh, that requires lawyers and paralegals to be culturally competent. So, um, you know, if you look at the profession, when I, when I went through law school, it was still uh, basically a white profession. Uh, half of my classmates were women, which was, you know, uh, that was around the time when things started to change. You look at it now and you look at who's, who's uh, graduating from our law schools, it's, it's become much more diverse, but the top of the bar, the people at my age are still, you know, uh, somewhat white and pale, if I could put it that way, right? So we have to, we have to take steps to make sure that um, lawyers and paralegals you know, reflect the diversity of the Canadian population. And we have to, um, we have to take steps to reconcile with our Indigenous brothers and sisters. So um, to me, um, EDI, it's not about teaching people to, uh, telling people what to think, it's about exposing them to a perspective that maybe they haven't thought of, and maybe really have never had any need to think about. And it's not a, I mean, you, you, JP, I know you go through it because every lawyer goes through it. It's not a significant amount of time. Um, so could we do a better job with EDI? Could we have better programs? I'm sure we could. But is it something that we need to do? Absolutely. And is it something that uh, other professions are doing? Absolutely. Yeah, so again, going contrary to that, you know, the, the full stop group, right? The sort of 
pillars of their or you know, at least their slogan on their website there is stop bloat stop creep stop woke i don't know if i got in the right order but you know how would you know in terms of you know if they are elected or in larger numbers this time you know how could this potentially be you know a problem you know for for the governance of you know lawyers and paralegals at the law society well if the um if the stop full stop group got a majority um they would roll back a lot of the law society's existing programs i mean they they are they don't actually have a really a program of being in favor of anything they have a program of being against a lot of things and i think that one of the things that's in uh peril would be edi and actually the whole idea of mandatory legal education which is widespread in the western world it's certainly uh you know entrenched across the united states and other jurisdictions so that's something to con con to be concerned about the fact that the group wants to um you know reduce the footprint of the law society means that you know all of the initiatives you see the law society undertaking from everything like holocaust remembrance day is that going to be one of the things that that group's going to want to cut just as an example um, you know, the Law Society does a lot of effort, which doesn't actually take a lot of money to promote diversity. Do you want those initiatives all to be cut back? Um, and the bigger question really is about independence of the profession. Right now, we are self-governing. That's been the case since, you know, the early 1800s. If the government of the day becomes convinced that, you know, uh, lawyers and paralegals are just going to fight amongst themselves and can't probably properly regulate themselves, they'll move in. That's what happened in the UK. Um, and it wouldn't take very long to happen here. So that's one of the reasons why I'm running, to be honest. Now, now with that in mind, certainly, um, you know, you have the experience of, of looking at it from those eight years that you were a bencher. And no, and there are other jurisdictions. I think it's like in Florida where you pay like two hundred and fifty dollars in licensing fees. Now, I mean, not obviously well versed of what's over there, but I mean, are there things that you know when they say bloat and, and creep, right? Or are there things that you know either we can be more efficient in in determining, or maybe you can kind of give us some perspective of looking at those budgets, you know, from uh, twenty twenty, well, so twenty eleven to uh, twenty nineteen, and saying, well, hey, you know, here's what. We can do it. I mean, like you said, some of the diversity initiatives can be done, you know, almost free, right? Like, I mean, I I, I certainly have guests that come and talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, and you, know, you can watch those for free. And and there's an hour, I think, you know, I don't know exactly the rules there for sort of the content, but uh, what can be done as sort of being more efficient in terms of spending, let's say? Well, um, first of all, you know, it's just not true that the group of ventures that I was um, part of. Uh, weren't interested in keeping the budget of the Law Society under control. I was the co-chair of audit and finance for two years. I presented the budget to convocation. Every year, we were extremely sensitive to the fact that, you know, um, lawyers and paralegals do not want their fees going up, particularly those in sole practice. And, our, and the fees have remained almost the same um there's been very little increase in fees over the last five years having said that there are always things we can do better as the profession gets larger and larger um you know we should expect some economies of scale and the law society is a large organization and there are you know people uh within the coalition i know some of my colleagues uh who you may be talking to who are very interested in making sure that we keep uh, the law society budget within, you know, reasonable limits. And so kind of how is this, this coalition, I know, uh, uh, again, talk to everyone about sort of, well, hey, you know, we pointed out, here's this one group, they've kind of run oh, in, in sort of the paraphrase kind of rough shot over the last four years, because they, they galvanized, you know, their 20 something odd members. Uh, that's a problem. But hey, you know, we're pretty much doing the same thing with the 40, 45 of us, uh, what in terms of, you know, the different perspectives certainly that are there, but what happens, 
you know, once the election is over, and, and again, we don't necessarily know who of the group is going to get elected, but what's going to happen in terms of is, is, is that same kind of problem going to happen, but now kind of on the other side of the equation? Well, that's a good question because the stop stop group, um, now full stop, uh, voted all together on almost everything at convocation, which wasn't the case prior to 2019. So, um, and our coalition is very clear that we're, although we're running as a group, uh, we're not going to be bound to each other as a group, and we've already agreed to disagree on certain things. So after the election, we're not planning on uh, sticking around as some uh, unified block that's going to, you know, block progress on one thing or another. And in fact, we we continue to email each other during while the election is on, and we disagree about lots of issues. But we do we do sh share some common values. Uh, one of those is civility. Uh, another one is acting in the public interest. And, you know, those are all on our website. So Peter, the last couple of questions here. First of all, there, there are students, hopefully of, of mine, or they're listening or law students that, you know, they're not going to be voting in the election. But uh, do you have any words of wisdom that we've talked a bit about articling and things like that, but that may affect them, but any words of wisdom for them as they look to enter into the profession? Well, anything you can do to help uh, the profession as a whole and reach out uh, beyond your you know, immediate interests uh, in getting ahead is always terrific. Anything you can do to volunteer, become involved in an organization, a, a local law association, the Advocate Society, Canadian Bar, Ontario Bar Association, anything like that will be terrific for you to help your career. And it'll be a way to meet people. And, you know, my experience has been that, you know, if you put back it, it helps you at the end of the day, it's, it's very re rewarding. It was very rewarding for me to be a bencher for eight years. And I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. Perfect. So Peter, thanks again for taking the time and joining us. Last question there is, why should, you know, I have a vote as a lawyer here. Why should I vote for you, Peter? And why should uh, you know, anyone listening, any of the lawyers listening, vote for you and the rest of the Good Governance Coalition? And once again, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I would just say, you know, the eight years I was a bencher, I really dug in. I was involved in almost all of the important initiatives uh, in that period, and I led a couple of them. I'm a hard worker, and I'm somebody who is thoughtful and listens, although I'm perhaps not as good a listener as you are, JP. Um, but I'm a good listener, and I am somebody who believes in civil discourse. Perfect. So all the best. Uh, and thanks again, Peter, for, for joining us. And thanks for everyone for tuning in. Take care. We'll continue on uh, tomorrow and uh, in the weeks to come before the election. Thanks again. Thanks very much.